Hello, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the International Fine Print Dealers Association. It is the IFPDA that is behind the current online print fair, and it is the IFPDA and its foundation that has organized and supported today's program and every other of the 19 programs in conjunction with cultural partners for what is more from print week to print month. Today, we have the first of two panels devoted to the winners of the IFPDA Foundation Book Award. First, an apology for the sunglasses. I'm not trying for a Tom Cruise look, but I am hiding an unseemly <laughs> black eye incurred two days ago as a result of wrestling on the floor with our fairly big and highly energetic 11-month-old Labradoodle puppy who, by the way, came out of it just fine. I'm David Tunick, president of the IFPDA, and we're here today to listen to the three principal authors of The Renaissance of Etching, the book that accompanied the exhibition of the same name that was mounted at the Metropolitan Museum and later shown at the Albertina in Vienna. The book is the winner of the annual IFPDA Foundation Book Award this year, shared with the women of Atelier 17, which you will hear about next week. We are not the only ones to have recognized the excellence of the Renaissance of Etching, the book and the exhibition, both received rave reviews in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Art Newspaper, the Washington Post, and other mainstream publications, including the London Sunday Times, which in its Book of the Year feature called it a quote, top pick of 2019. Here's how today's program will work. We'll begin with a PowerPoint talk by Nadine Orenstein, followed by a panel discussion with our two other distinguished guests, Freda Spira and Catherine Jenkins. When the panel discussion ends, we'll conclude with a Q&A session. You should be able to find the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen when you drag your mouse down. When you click on the Q&A button, you can type in your question anytime during the program. We'll get to as many as we can, as many questions as we can at the end. So let's, let's get started. It is my distinct privilege to introduce Dr. Nadine Ornstein, Drew Hines Curator in Charge, Department of Drawings and Prints, Metropolitan Museum of Art. A New York native, Nadine is a graduate of Barnard College and earned her doctorate in art history at the NYU Institute of Fine Art, where she and I first met in a seminar that I co-taught with Nadine's mentor, Egbert Haverkamp Begemann. Nadine is best known internationally as one of the world's foremost scholars in old master Dutch and Flemish prints and drawings by artists such as Bosch, Gossard, Bruegel, Goltzius, Sagers, Rembrandt, and many others. But she has also published on subjects as diverse as photography, caricature, and Genoese art spanning the centuries. Nadine, you're on. Hi, thank you, David. And um, on behalf of my co-authors, Catherine Jenkins and Freda Spira, uh, thank you so much to the IFPDA Foundation for honoring this book. Um, that was many years in the making and um, we're really thrilled uh, that we're getting uh, recognition from the IFPDA. In addition, I would like to thank uh, the other contributors to our catalog, Peter Furing, Don LaRocca, and Varick Lauder, Christoph Metzger, Femke Spielberg, Ad Steinmann, Pierre Terjanian and Julia Zaunbauer for their contributions to the catalog. And also, since we're recognizing the catalog, I have to thank our incredible editorial uh, department team led by Mark Palazzotti, um, especially uh, the uh, great uh, editing by Elizabeth Block and Margaret Aspinwall, and uh, to the whole team who I've listed here on the slide. Um, Thanks so much for your, uh, you know, the, the Met um, editorial uh, team creates beautiful books every time. And um, it's because of all of the hard work from everyone involved. And also many thanks to the generous supporters uh, for our exhibition and catalog, uh, Diane W. and James E. Burke Fund, Placido Arango Fund, the Schiff Foundation, Anne and Matthew Nimitz, the Drew Heinz Fund and the Tavolozza Foundation. 
Um, this is a view of our exhibition. Um, I should also recognize uh, Xiaoxi Chen Laurent and uh, Frank Mondragon for their beautiful design of our exhibition. As I said, this exhibition was a very long time in coming. We worked on it for at least uh, 10 years and, and it's not for uh, any reason except that for various reasons it kept getting postponed, but very happily it landed last year when the Met was also showing um, the exhibition of Ma Emperor Maximilian. Uh, it was an armor exhibition about, around Emperor Maximilian who was active at exactly the same period covered by uh, the Renaissance of etching. And it was just such a great uh, coincidence of exhibitions um, since etching really got its start with armor making. Um, uh, people really enjoyed being able to go back and forth uh, to the two exhibitions. And uh, this is just another shot of the uh, show and you can see we brought in um, uh, these uh, beautiful uh, plates of the survey of Vienna by Augustine Hirschvogel that were done in 1552 um, uh, etched plates, copper plates along with the print of the survey of Vienna and um, those plates probably have or I'm pretty sure have not left <laughs> the place where they're housed uh, today um, since 1552 so we were just delighted that um, uh, they lent them to our exhibition. Now etching um, was something uh, that artists today practice in pretty much the same way they did back in the early 16th century. Uh, but it was in the early 16th century, late 15th, early 16th century when etching really got its start. And um, the period that's covered by our exhibition is really this moment of great experimentation and invention when every artist is trying the technique, some of them like it, some of them don't. Lots of artists all around Europe were experimenting with this technique. It started, got it start in Germany, um, but, and you can see here, I have an example by Albert Dürer, who was one of the great um, sort of, I think once everyone found out Dürer was etching, they all wanted to try it. <laughs> um, but you can see, and Lucas van Leiden definitely had his eye on Dürer, but you can see even just in this comparison, uh, everyone is trying to figure out, each artist trying to figure out what will etching do for me? How can I use it? Um, Albert Dürer clearly uses it just like he does drawing. And his style of etching is very much like his drawing style. We can see uh, Lucas van Leiden used etching to make engravings and he liked engravings and he only made five etchings all the same year. And then he gave it up and went on to back to what he was doing and I guess felt more comfortable doing. Now, why would we even focus on etching? Well, um, in the late 15th century, there were basically two techniques available for making prints. One is uh, the woodcut, and you can see by the example on the left from about 1460, is a pretty simple affair, uh, big outlines and uh, hand colored. On the right, and sorry it's being cut off by all of our faces, but this is a beautiful print by uh, Martin Schungauer, and that's an engraving. And so these were the two techniques available. Uh, the fact is, although uh, Schungauer could do amazing things with engraving, it took years and years of training, as did woodcut. Um, the thing about etching is it allowed pretty much anybody who had a plate available, it, may, it allowed them uh, to make a print because it was very much like a uh, drawing. So, and here is an example uh, from our exhibition, Albrecht Altdorfer's Landscape with Two Spruces, a rather tiny print, uh, but in the detail on the right, you can really see that the lines are very much like drawing lines, very loose and free, and you didn't need to have these years of training to be able to do it. Um, a, a landscape really flourished, a landscape printing really flourished um, with etching because it was so uh, drawing-like. And here is a wonderful example uh, from the Albertina of another um, etching by Altdorfer, which is hand colored. And you can really see they almost look like it almost, it could easily be mistaken for a drawing. And uh, certainly etchings like these appealed to collectors of drawings who were really um, sort of, be, there was, this is the moment when um, uh, the idea of just collecting drawings and collecting prints is really getting its start. 
Now, um, I just want to share with you, I'm sure most of the people on this um, uh, here know how to make an etching. You're all print uh, people, but I just want to point out to you our wonderful uh, website feature um, about, it's called the materials and techniques of drawings and prints. And we have features on every kind of um, uh, technique of drawing and print. And, and you can just uh, search on the Met website materials and techniques and it will come up or you can search etching and it will come up and I will just show you what it is. So this shows you how to make an etching. So here are the tools. Um, here is our wonderful assistant Liz Zanis, who's an artist who is showing how you cover the plate with ground. Uh, then you draw through the ground. Uh, then you put your plate in the acid and uh, wipe off the ground. Uh, ink the printing plate and then print it and uh, runs through the press and then presto it comes out and there you have your print. So uh, etching, uh, the point is uh, you should all come and have a look at our website but also etching is a pretty um, uh, simple thing to do. Daniel Hupfer is the first person really to make etchings on paper. Um, he was also involved with making armor. And so it's not a big leap. Uh, people had been et like etching was not, the technique of etching was not new at this moment in the early uh, 15, uh, 16th century, but um, it had been around, people have been etching metal for a very long time, but um, uh, nobody had been printing them on paper. And it was really, uh, people had been etching armor and there were great etchers of armor at this time. And then it was really Hupfer who was involved with the decoration of armor who started making prints. And he was a prolific printmaker. He brought the experimental techniques that they were using with armor into making prints. And, and um, all of his prints are, are sort of fascinating to look at in terms of their technique. And you can see in these, this image of a death and the devil surprising two women that um, this image of the, of, of the devil is done in sort of a reverse technique to the black lines on white uh, background um, of all of the other prints. Um, then we were, ve were very lucky in the Met to also have a Hupfer armor. And this is either by Hupfer himself or somebody in his um, you know, immediate surroundings. But um, you can really see that uh, uh, these, his decoration here at least is very much, they look like prints. And in fact, some of them are copied uh, from uh, other prints. Um, the thing about armor is it's expensive. It's made for a patron, it's unique. And what's interesting about the transition from armor to etching on paper is that it turns into an art that is almost the exact opposite. So etching, you make one etching, etching plate, and then you make lots of very inexpensive prints. It's more uh, populist. It's something that can be circulated. So it's uh, almost the opposite of making a, a piece of armor. Now, Albrecht Dürer, as I said, uh, Hupfer was the first one, but once Dürer got a hold of etching and he tried, as you probably know, all different techniques, um, uh, I'm sure uh, people started taking notice. And here um, we have this wonderful uh, drawing from the Albertina and, um, and uh, Dürer's uh, print after it of the agony in the garden. Um, and you can see that uh, here, hopefully you can see how very drawing-like uh, Dürer's etched lines are. Uh, this is a fantastic, sorry, all of our faces are in the way of this fantastic triptych by Nicholas Hogenberg, who is a Netherlandish artist, a group, a part of the group of very early Netherlandish artists who in the 1520s started looking at etching and, and deciding whether it was for them or not. Hogenberg uh, loved etching, clearly. Um, this is a triptych, quite large, um, fantastic, uh, in blinding impressions of these prints. And we were very lucky to get the set uh, from the Bibliothèque Nationale for the exhibition. As far as I know, there are only two sets of these prints, the other one in Dresden that are equally blinding. Um, uh, I was looking at these prints very closely because they had always been called just etching. And in fact, I, found, I realized that the center panel is engraved and the two side panels are etched. And it's sort of peculiar why if you have an image that's supposed to connect like this, why would you use two different techniques? Uh, everything is dated the same year. And um, the only thing I can think of is that he was trying to make a point that etching, which in many instances in early etchings were very light and pale and, and not punchy, dark, strong uh, works. Um, he, here, he was trying to make the point that etching could rival engraving. But 
my theory anyway. Um, one of my favorite artists in the show, Jan Vermeyen, who made um, quite a number of etchings, including these wonderful uh, uh, images, very unusual images of traditional subjects like the Virgin and Child with an Angel, but inspired by his experience in, in Spain. Um, uh, he, well, uh, Dürer made etchings that look like drawings. Lucas van Leiden made etchings that look like engravings. Uh, Vermeyen makes etchings that look like paintings. And he really has this very strong dark and light. And you really, and he, he manages to get a lot of texture and, and the feel sort of three dimensionality of the figures. Now in Italy, oh, sorry that this is being covered up, but um, in Italy, there you go, maybe. Um, in Italy, uh, the earliest artist to really make etchings is uh, Parmigianino. He brings his experience having worked with chiaroscuro woodcutters um, to etching. So he is printing in colors. Uh, he is using plate tone to create that overall um, like uh, color uh, background to the print. And then he also takes uh, his piece of cloth and um, wipes away some of the ink of the plate tone to make highlights. And, um, and so this is like very unusual for the time. Uh, it's something that being someone who studies Netherlandish artists, I, I associate with Rembrandt who was working 100 and almost 150 years later. And I have no doubt that Rembrandt must have been looking at uh, Parma Giannino prints and uh, seeing how he did this. Uh. Um, among the other um, fascinating artists in Italy, um, there are these uh, art, there are several artists in Venice and Verona. Some of them are influenced by Parmigianino. Others are influenced by Titian and make these beautiful uh, landscape prints. Um, this one by Battista Franco was one of my favorites in the show. And then on the right, uh, unfortunately, he's partly covered over, but uh, Sebastiano de Valentinis, one of my favorite uh, wacky artists in the exhibition, he um, only made three etchings in his career. And, um, and this is an incredible, powerful uh, image of Prometheus and, and rather rare uh, prints as well. Now, um, uh, that is to so uh, uh, De Valentinis only made three etchings. There are quite a number of artists who tried etching and then just decided to give it up. It just wasn't for them. And you know, not every technique is for every artist. Um, here is a print by Beham. He made about six or seven etchings all one year. Um, you can see from this one, it's like uh, un unevenly printed. It's not strongly printed. These things, I think he was doing them more for himself than for the market. They're very rare. I think he was probably trading them with friends, things like that. And, and all of them are a little humorous. They're not the sort of thing he normally does. They're larger than some of the prints that he does. And they're kind of, uh, you can, you get the feeling they're not, they're not made uh, like all of his, uh, to be like all of his other prints. And of course, this one is kind of a takeoff on Albert Dürer's famous nemesis. And here he has kind of this woman's uh, fortune's uh, rear <laughs> looking straight out at the viewer. Um, in France, uh, around the court of Francis I, King Francis I, he was uh, creating his chateau at Fontainebleau, and there was quite a number of printmakers uh, around there who were making prints of the decorations at Fontainebleau. So Antonio Fantuzzi um, did these, uh, the print on the left after Rosso Fiorentino, um, and it's based, uh, the, at least the frame is based uh, directly on some of the decorations in the palace at Fontainebleau. Uh, the center uh, image of the landscape is really uh, like a Netherlandish landscape that's been put into the center, perhaps um, to make, uh, make it all more saleable. I don't know. Um, on the right um, is a print by Master IV, and he has this symbol in the center of his um, monogram, which is the symbol for copper. And this is a view of a bay, and I, I put it up. It, it's a, it's a wild, <laughs> crazy print. It's not directly after uh, the decorations at Fontainebleau, but clearly inspired by them. And um, but the the thing I wanted to say is, we bought this, I believe, about two, maybe three years ago, uh, at the time of the print fair from Hillstone, and uh, it was actually a print that we were going to put in our exhibition anyway. We were going to borrow it from the British Museum, and then this print came up um, that we could purchase and, and we were delighted to have it for our collection. And on top of that, that freed up one of our loans from the British Museum so we could bring something else um, in uh, from that institution. 
Um, finally, the last room of our show was about what I was calling the professionalization of etching. So uh, the early part of the show is really about this experimental moment when everybody is looking at this technique and trying to figure out what is it that etching can do for me. By the time you get to the 1550s, uh, everybody knows how to etch. And now it's like, well, now what can we do with etching? And, and the person who I think is one of the more important ones for this issue is Hieronymus Koch, who this, he made this print, but he is better known as a print publisher. And he was one of the most prolific publishers of etchings in the 16th century. And part of the reason he did, he was so prolific is he hired uh, these two guys, Jan and Lucas van Dudekum, uh, brothers who were re reproductive etchers. That means they didn't, really make their own images. They only reproduced other people's designs in etching and they exclusively really worked in etching. And, um, and they made hundreds of prints uh, for Hieronymus Koch and he just put them to work um, and they were very active. So these are two uh, wonderful prints after Cornelis Floris who was a well-known um, architect and sculptor of the time. Uh, the thing about um, a cook is he figured out who were the best artists to work with and who were the best printmakers to work with and he sort of paired everybody up. And uh, so here on the left, he got a hold of Peter Bruegel. And as you may know, Peter Bruegel made many uh, engravings, uh, designs for engravings for Hieronymus Cook. On the left is his one, um, uh, his only etching that he made himself, the only print that he made himself. And, and on the right is a print after uh, Bruegel's design um, by the Dudekum brothers. So another etching and, and um, hard to see in images like this, but in person in the show, you could really see the total difference between uh, the almost drawing-like etching by Bruegel himself and then slightly harder, uh, more um, detail-oriented um, uh, etching by these people who were making a great effort to reproduce uh, Bruegel's design. Um, this is a team of um, etcher, etcher uh, painter, a designer who worked together and made hundreds of prints together. Uh, Martin van Heemskerk, who was a painter, and Dirk Volkerts Kornherd, who was a, a philosopher, theologian, but also an etcher. And uh, together they came up with these incredible um, allegorical prints. Uh, these are quite large. And basically by the end of the show, you can see etchings. They know how to make etchings at that point and etchings have become uh, very large. This is in two uh, plates, two, two sheets of paper and uh, really a wonderful print. And then just to finish, um, this is a print by Franz Hogenberg, who is actually the son of Nicholas Hogenberg, who made the triptych that I showed you earlier. And uh, he was, they were both living in Mechelen. Mechelen was uh, started out as a court city. And, um, and it was a moment of where, you know, even people at the court were fascinated in this new technique of etching. Uh, by the time we get to Franz Hogenberg, uh, Mechelen seems to be the place where a lot of etchers are being trained and uh, coming out of Mechelen and making these large, uh, beautiful uh, etchings. So this is uh, the hay wagon, hay wagon, sorry, um, by Franz Hogenberg. It's a, uh, a print full of, um, uh, sayings, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, played out <laughs> in the scene. So on the bottom right, you have, you know, the blind leading the blind and, um, and uh, the hay wagon comes from the scene that you see here in the center, um, where the devil is on the top of this big hay wagon and waving, uh, you know, little handfuls of hay. And then all of these people are um, running after the hay wagon, like madly pulling at the hay, you know, pulling at nothing. So hay in, the, in this scene um, represents, you know, like this quest for nothing, you know, venal things and, and um, things that don't, don't mean anything. So that is a small nutshell view of our um, exhibition. And I will pass things back to David and, um, and our, my colleagues. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, uh, Nadine, <laughs> a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm gonna introduce our other two uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Freda uh, Spira is an associate curator in the drawings and prints department of the Metropolitan Museum of Art where she started in 2008. She specializes in Northern Renaissance and Baroque prints, drawings, and illustrated books. Freda's exhibitions at the Met 
besides the Renaissance of etching are The Last Night, The Art, Armor, and Ambition of Maximilian I, The Power of Prince, colon, The Legacy of William Ivins and Hyatt Mayer, Wordplay, Matthias Buchinger's drawings from the collection of Ricky J. Durr and Beyond, Central European drawings and at the National Gallery in Washington, Imperial Augsburg Renaissance prints and drawings. I'll also add that one of my favorite things about Freda, in addition to her love of Durr, is her special interest and expertise in the baseball card collection at the Met, the biggest in the country. <laughs> Freda earned her BA from Barnard and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She's currently working on an exhibition about notions of place in Danish 19th century art in collaboration with the Getty and the National Gallery of Denmark in Copenhagen, scheduled for 2023. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Catherine Jenkins. Um, she's with us today from her home in London. Catherine is an independent scholar raised and educated in the UK at the University of Edinburgh and Oxford where she got her doctorate with a thesis written under the supervision of Anthony Griffith and Martin Kemp. Catherine worked for eight years as a curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Met, where her responsibilities included oversight of French prints and drawings up to 1600 and Italian prints up to 1800. Her books, articles, contributions to exhibition catalogs, fellowships and awards are far too numerous to list here but we will mention that Catherine's publications include three volumes entitled Prince at the Court of Fountainbleau, 1542-1547, which came out in 2017. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly for what this is all about today, the Renaissance of etching was Catherine's idea. So to kick off the uh, panel discussion, uh, Catherine, let's start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, the original idea was yours, but what was the origin of the idea itself? Well, it, it, um, it grew out of my research on the, not surprisingly, on the Fontainebleau School of Printmakers, who were active at the Chateau of Fontainebleau in the 1540s, um, and who were mainly etchers. And quite late on in my research, um, I realized that the, the, the inspiration behind the, the enterprise was Parmigianino's workshop, which was active over a decade earlier um, in the late 1520s in Bologna. And yet the prints that emerged from those two centers um, looked very different. So that led me to think, well, maybe it would be an interesting idea for an exhibition to see the way that the first generations of etchers uh, adopted etching um, uh, across Europe. Um, I also hoped that it would be a, a beautiful exhibition. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't want to interfere with any discussion that you may want to have among you, so just jump in any time. I do have a question uh, for Freda, because I remember the day Freda not, doesn't seem that long ago at the Met in the uh, print study room, when I came in to compare a Durer Cannon with the uh, museum's impression, and you and I got into a discussion of uh, Durer as an etcher and when etching uh, began. But why organize an exhibition? I was originally gonna put this to Nadine, so either one of you. Uh, why organize an exhibition so focused on technique and why focus on etching specifically? So Freda, do you wanna have a go at it uh, first? Sure, I mean, I remember the day too when you came in and we started talking about etching and Daniel Hopfer, who I obviously wrote my dissertation about, which was a wonderful sort of a link between Catherine and I working on dissertations about etching topics and being able to then rethink it um, in terms of a museum exhibition. But I think Nadine touched on the point of why etching was so important um, in the 16th century when printmaking became such a thriving uh, media to communicate ideas um, and uh, images. Uh, etching really was a new medium, a new media and in this age of digital, uh, we're inundated by images and I think etching really was one of those um, very significant moments uh, where printmaking opened up to all kinds of artists. Um, I know uh, I saw one of the questions in the chat was about uh, the need for strength and dexterity when you're uh, creating prints and that's definitely true with engravings but with etching you have a coating for the plate and so you draw onto 
a wax um, a wax uh, surface. So it's not it doesn't take strength. It doesn't take um, immense amounts of uh, manual strength. And so it opened it up for everyone to use. And so that really is a pivotal moment for printmaking in the early part of um, the Renaissance. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the exhibition uh, evolved. I think it took quite a long time. You alluded to that, uh, Nadine. Do you wanna speak to that for a moment? Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, I found my notes from, I think, 2008, <laughs> which was a long time ago, <laughs> and when we first started working on the show, and, um, and what happened, it was nothing, uh, you know, outrageous, it was just uh, Catherine uh, went back to London uh, for her own personal reasons, and so then uh, Freda came on board, and then, and then uh, it's just like one thing after another, we were supposed to uh, first, um, we had been talking to the Rijksmuseum about organizing uh, the show with them, but then they got a new director and he decided to do other things. And so it was just like one thing after another kept postponing the show, uh, but it actually ended up being at such a good moment. So I think it all, you know, everything is for a reason and it ended up being, you know, so well timed and totally out of the blue with uh, Pierre Turgenian's exhibition on Emperor Maximilian that we're happy uh, that it worked out that way. And I but think when did also the Seder's exhibition it, actually begin, because I also wondered if that was one of the inspirations for uh, th this exhibition, both of which I thought were among the most beautiful I've ever seen in any museum, any medium. Uh, which one was that? Uh, no, the Seder's. Oh, Seger's, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, well, originally uh, the idea was the Rijksmuseum and the Met would do uh, uh, the etching show together and the Sager show together. And um, what ended up happening is we did the Sager show together and then the etching show was gonna come after that. I can't even remember the reasons why. And then that didn't work out. But the, the original idea was everybody would be prepped for what an etching is and then they would see the Sager's exhibition and then they would <laughs> like, you know, see how a, a totally uh, creative and inventive that was as well. So, but it didn't work out that way, but that's all right, I think. <laughs> And I, I think just to just to um, pop in, I think we're we were incredibly lucky to partner with the Albertina, who was so incredibly generous uh, with their collection um, and their uh, specialist Christoph Metzger, obviously uh, very invested in Daniel Hopfer, worked on an exhibition uh, with him about him in Munich, and he was uh, one of the first uh, people. Uh, to travel widely to look at Hopfer's work and to discover an unknown album um, in uh, Bologna and to be able to date things earlier. Um, and so we were, I think, very pleased, all of us, because the Albertina's collection is so vast um, to be able to work with them. Right. Um, Catherine, maybe you can tell us, what, were there loans that you didn't get that you think would have enhanced uh, the exhibition? even more. I mean, hard to imagine, but um, were there any regrets in that, in that regard? I mean, not really. Everyone was very generous and we, we got the loans that, uh, that we requested. What we did have to do for budgetary reasons was make a few cuts um, in, the last, in the last year. Um, and so the, the, the two slight regrets I have, but it didn't make a big difference, was I wanted the first state of Battista Franco St. Jerome, which I found in Berlin, which showed how meticulously he etched his plates first before, um, he, before it got engraved. And that led me to think perhaps that he wasn't engraving his plates because um, he was very busy in the last 10 years of his, of his career and he was producing such a detailed underdrawing and etching that my idea was perhaps then he was handing over the plates to be engraved professionally, because as far as I know, he, he didn't train as an engraver as such. Was um, that because, so that, sorry, was that because they couldn't lend it that you didn't? No, because we, we had to cut, oh. make a few cuts towards the end, um, yeah. And it ended up being the one thing we wanted from Berlin and we couldn't really justify it borrowing one thing, it's quite expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, that was really the main thing. There was a drawing from the Tylers as well, uh, Luca Penny, uh, Death of Adonis, which would have been nice to show 
next to the print, but really no regrets. <laughs> Can I just um, point out some of the really incredible loans that we did get for the show? So um, from uh, the uh, museum in Basel, uh, like the most blinding, I think the unique early impression of, Han of Brookmeyer's um, Mercury and Venus, which we showed alongside the printing plate from the British Museum, like incredible opportunity to see these together and also to see that print, which you do see around, but never in such an incredible uh, impression. Um, you know, I think it's really, I find it very important. Um, you know, the thing about prints is one could easily borrow, you know, use a lesser impression. We have an impression of that print in our collection, uh, which isn't as good. But I, th I think it's really important if you're doing an exhibition that focuses on prints that you should uh, do as much as you can to bring in the really brilliant impressions to show what uh, the print really should look like <laughs> and not you know, a lesser impression. Well, Nadine, once you got all the stuff together, all the material arrived uh, in New York at the Met um, mm. and you were able to see them all uh, together, um, did your views all with regard to the exhibition? Um, well, uh, I think, you know, we you could see, once the, the work started coming out of the crates, you really started seeing uh, the, the story unfold. And what really became apparent, because we had organized the exhibition according to areas like uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, France, uh, you really started to see the how different the prints looked in both in all of those different places when you know when you could see them all together and and I think every uh, uh, curator has this moment when you know they've been writing a catalog over a long period of time they went to visit all of the artworks and then like everything comes together and the works start coming out of the crates and you're like crossing your fingers that like everything you said <laughs> makes sense and is right <laughs> once you get it all together. But I think in this case, it really uh, kind of underscored what we had been saying uh, in the catalog, how different uh, the approaches to etching in every part of Europe, uh, how different they were. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Freda, do you want to address it? Uh, how, how the technique differed in different parts of Europe or stylistic manner differed? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because we were working very closely together and um, we all, as Nadine was saying, you know, we were all waiting, you know, with bated breath for the crates to open. And I think what became obvious also is that we have like our deep loves. Um, and so when the things come out and they're so spectacular, <laughs> we were we were so excited to see them. Um, and especially the things in our area, but also things outside of our area, which we weren't able to, um, you know, not all of us were able to travel and see. Uh, but I think, you know, as a, a, a German um, printmaking person, um, you know, my reverence for Daniel Hopfer is very different um, than um, people outside of uh, the field. And, um, you know, his experimentation, the sort of what people call decorative aspect of what he's doing um, is off-putting, whereas um, Albrecht Dürer seems to open up the field of uh, etching for other artists. Um, in a way that I don't, I don't necessarily see it that way. So I feel like um, it was a great instructive way uh, for all of us together to be able to communicate about how um, different and fascinating each artist, even amongst each field, uh, is using it differently. How they're using different colored papers, how they're using different consistencies of ink, how they're using cross hatching or parallel lines, um, how experimental they are. And what's wonderful is to be able to talk to colleagues and artists about, you know, one day I wanted to try this, so I did. Um, and to be able to see it through the, through the time period that we uh, looked at was, was really fascinating. And um, I just um, learned so much by looking at the objects with my colleagues um, and with the public. Um, and just to know that each artist really is, um, you know, you talk about Aldorfer and you talk about the hand of the artist. Well, that's the case for everyone. Um, uh, Parmigianino is such a fine um, technician, but also incredibly um, creative and meaningful and finds meaning in different aspects of the work. And so I think we all recognize that um, everyone's coming out of their own context and everyone is using the technique um, to the best of their abilities. Um, sticking with the Germans for a moment, um, 
Durr, Durr was brilliant uh, in every way, not least as a matter of technique. Why didn't he try etching on copper instead of iron, uh, which produced results, as we all know, that quickly became messy due to the rusting, the very quick rusting of the iron? Well, I mean, my my hypothesis is that uh, he really learned um, in the same way that Hopfer and Berkmeyer um, and the Augsburg artists learned to etch um, through the um, the armor decorating uh, trade. He uh, was working with Emperor Maximilian. He was creating designs for armor. And so the materials that he had on hand, the acid that he had on hand um, or that he could get, he was getting from Augsburg um, and from armor decorators who were also working um, in Nuremberg, and it was just what what was available at the time. And I think right. he was willing to try it out. And he is a brilliant technician. Um, and I think you know his etchings are incredibly interesting. And when you were able to see his drawings next to his etchings, um, you get a sense of what he's trying to do. When you talk to um, you know Jerry Cohen and Susan Dackerman, and you talk about how he's using different uh, viscosities of ink and how he's using paper and different things on the press to create uh, areas of focus. Um, he's, he's exploring. And I think, I think, you know, just because they're not um, nemesis, they're not his engravings and he doesn't stick with it. It doesn't mean that he was um, completely dissatisfied. Um, can, I, can I add something to that? Can I add something yes. to that, David? Um, I was going through the show uh, with uh, someone who's a famous uh, master printer, uh, you know, contemporary, <laughs> and, um, and who has worked with lots of fam famous artists. So we were going through the show and we stop at the Durer prints and he looks at it and he, for a long time and he says, um, you know, I think Durer didn't like etching. And I said, well, I think I think you're right. And he said, because, you know, if I were working, you can see it in his lines. He's not happy with the way the etching, you know, he's tight and he's not happy with how the etching is going. And he said, if I were working with him, I would suggest that he try a different technique. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I think you can see that there's a reason why he didn't stick with it. He, like, there was something that was sort of frustrating. And, and we had another, um, uh, print master printer who did a, an event for us named Jason Sh uh, Squila, um, who was working on a, um, a, a particular aspect of, of etching. And he said, you know, the thing about etching is once you put your plate in the acid, you have to just let go, you lose control. And for a Durer, who is an artist of supreme control, I think it just wasn't for him. It was like, you don't know what's gonna come out from that acid bath. And, and I think the loss of control was a, a frustra uh, was frustration for him. <laughs> I don't know, Freda agrees. <laughs> very, very good point. Um, and that leads to another question I had, because uh, you mentioned master printers and going around the exhibition with them. As a dealer, I'm struck, I have been for many years, by how many household named contemporary artists come in to look at and to buy um, old master prints. Uh, did any of you have uh, similar experiences with the artists that you could possibly share, and including the name of the artist uh, who might have visited the exhibition? Catherine? I'm afraid I um, was only there the, for the opening. Hopefully <laughs> <laughs> me who was there. <laughs> but um, I don't know that we had, or I'm sure that they went through, but I, to be honest, I know uh, the ones who were doing events for us uh, went through the show, but um, I know there are other artists who are great fans of our Johnson Gallery, which is our gallery of ro rotating uh, works um, from our collection that's on all the time. And, and so I'm sure that there were a lot. Of, I mean, I, to be honest, I think the Sager show, I heard a lot more from contemporary artists about going through that show and because uh, he's such a contemporary looking etcher. Um, but uh, I know a lot of artists went through uh, the etching show. Uh, Catherine, can you talk about what pivotal turning points were? Uh, I mean, a really a broad kind of overview in the development of early uh, uh, etching. Yes, well, uh, 
the, the pivotal moments were, of course, Hopfer <laughs> and, and the emergence of the medium. Um, and, uh, and I think you can really say that there are pivotal moments in the development of etching almost in every century. <laughs> um, because, so you have the beginnings that we've traced in our, in our exhibition. Um, and you won't be surprised to hear that I think Palmer Giannino is one of the great early printmakers, a real pioneer for the reasons that Nadine outlined in her presentation. Um, and then if you jump to the 17th century, you have Callo, who uh, is inventing hard ground, a shop, uh, uh, tools, and then of course Rembrandt. And then during the 18th century, especially in France, um, some of the leading artists were adopting uh, etching as a fundamental part of their, of their practice. And Perrin Stein's great exhibition a few years ago um, highlighted these artists like Boucher, Fragonard, and Lyotard, and Saint-Aubin. Um, and it was a moment when people were writing a lot about etching as well. And of course that crescendoed in the etching revival period in the 19th century. Um, and that became an actual movement um, with treatises and societies and, um, and um, artists expressing that you really, that, that, that the spirit of the artist um, his creative prowess was in the graphic line. So um, I'm afraid I find it very hard to narrow down to one moment. And this is why etching is still practiced today. Um, I don't know if I've missed anything out, uh, Fredo, Nadine. <laughs> no, that's a very good overview. <laughs> you're, you're, gonna, you, you're all gonna hate this uh, question, but I'm gonna ask it um, anyway, uh, put it to all of you. Who is the best etcher of them all? Uh, it's impossible to answer, extremely subjective, but we'd certainly be interested in your views as uh, consummate experts. I mean, would you say Rembrandt, Goya, Picasso? Anybody else? <laughs> I would say all Rembrandt. The above. <laughs> yeah, I would and add Whistler. Votes for Rembrandt, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would just add Whistler to the list. I think he's um, a pretty amazing etcher, but uh, I think we have to give it all to Rembrandt. Um, <laughs> just because- he was of course looking at Hercules Sager, so <laughs> <laughs> the other one. <laughs> so yeah. maybe your answer is to that uh, question. It's either, uh, it's, I'd say Sager's was the most interesting, fascinating experimental one. And Rembrandt was the one who like made it, uh, you know, into something, uh, something else that other people could follow. <laughs> but right. so I'd say it's a tie. <laughs> right. okay, with, with 10 minutes to go, why don't we turn to um, some of the questions that people have, unless any of you wish to add anything I else? I want to just want to say one thing on the on the question of artists who came to uh, see the show. Um, I just want to remind everybody that Swoon last year at the print fair did uh, an etching display and the idea was uh, to do a tie in with the exhibition and, and she of course was fascinated by the technique of etching. And it was a fantastic uh, display at the at the opening of the print fair last year at the Javits Center. Right, it was not only at the opening, it was at the opening of the fair and it was huge. And, yeah, that's uh, what I meant. That was what I meant, at the, op uh, the entrance, I guess the entrance to the fair. Right, and she referenced back to Gawander <laughs> and so on um, in, in that uh, huge installation. Um, so here are some of the uh, questions that have come in, in the audience. This one from the famous anonymous attendee, that's the name. Can you talk about your partnership with the Albertina just a bit more? You already have, so maybe in uh, 20 seconds or something. Maybe. So, um, so I'm sorry. I, I, go ahead. Rada, go ahead. Uh, no, so Christoph Metzger, who was in Munich and then mo moved to the Albertina and is uh, chief curator there, uh, he and I worked on a Hopfer exhibition together. 
And um, I was thrilled um, to be able to approach him about being a partner on uh, the etching show, um, which Nadine and Catherine were um, all for. And to our su great surprise um, and delight, they agreed um, not only to lend to the exhibition, but to lend their expertise uh, for the catalog. And the show, which went to the um, Albertina um, almost directly after ours, um, had to um, close down during the pandemic and then was able to reopen um, and has just closed very recently. So it had a very long run uh, in Vienna and I think is one of the most successful old master shows that they've been that they've had in a very long time. Um, and I know uh, from our partners there that the catalog, um, which we're celebrating today has sold out there and they uh, got more copies. And so I think we feel very lucky um, that we had such a, a generous partner. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Emily Peters. Uh, for Catherine and about the French etchers, who was the most imaginative in terms of what the etching medium could do? Um, hi, Emily. Um, <laughs> um, so I would say without a doubt, um, some of the Fontainebleau uh, etchers, but of all of them, the master IV. Um, the thing about, uh, the wonderful thing about etching is it um, opened up uh, printmaking to artists who were not trained printmakers and also not top tier artists. You had sort of minor artists who would combine sources um, in whimsical uh, and expressive ways. And the Master IV um, certainly did that. And I'm wondering, um, Cherie, could you bring up um, slide number five, please, so I can show the audiences um, one of the typical prints, um, so it should come up soon. Here we are. Yeah. So um, this is a clear example of, I don't think any, this kind of image could not be created in any other medium apart from etching. Um, it's uh, <laughs> um, so what you have is uh, a figure that's from a lost composition by Michelangelo and against a tree, uh, he is not a Saint Sebastian, there are no, there are no um, arrows piercing his, his flesh and he's put in a landscape probably inspired by uh, Cousin the Elder. And it's a subjectless image, we don't really know what we're looking at. Um, but it's, it's modern um, and I think people would have appreciated it for the contraposto, the interesting figure. Um, there's no, no writing, um, no indication of who the designer was, who the artist was. Um, so uh, yes, and these are the kind of whimsical and expressive images that, that the Fontainebleau art artists were producing. Right, thank you for that, uh, Catherine. Uh, Marianne Pontius, if I am uh, mispronouncing that, forgive me, has a question for Nadine. Did particular pictorial motifs co-occur on armory and in etchings? I will pass that on to Freda, who's actually the, our <laughs> resident armor specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, there are uh, many, um, I guess, ornament pattern sheets um, that uh, where the etchings on paper uh, exactly uh, mirror the etchings that you find on armor. There also um, are, um, I would what I would call like random sources. So like a baldung uh, Saint Sebastian woodcut ends up on on the back plate of an armor, and this becomes more and more frequent. Um, as armor decoration um, sort of explodes in the 16th century that prints are used as sources. Uh, but Daniel Hopfer, about 30% of his output is um, sort of these ornamental motifs um, that reappear um, in etching that's produced in Augsburg and Nuremberg um, all the way until the end of the century. Um, here's a question from Louis Warschauer. Uh, I think that a lot of particularly beginning collectors uh, might join in asking, uh, with Rembrandt, do you, any of you, see an advantage or a trade-off in the reworking of a plate to a new state? Does the addition of an interesting new element 
have to detract from the clarity, or does it detract from the clarity of the print? Nadine. Well, I think, uh, I know this is a huge subject, but uh, I mean, Rembrandt's states are really a reflection of his working process. And in his paintings, you see him like going over and making changes, but you can only see that through, you know, X-ray and infrared photography. But with prints, you can see every stage of how he's rethinking or thinking an image through. And I think that is the fascinating part about Rembrandt's states. Uh, there may be certain states that he decided to do just because he thought uh, it would be good for the market. But I think most of them are really him like taking an image. And you see that him doing this in all of his work. He was always constantly looking at something, thinking, OK, how can I make it different? How can I change it once he's gone through uh, as much as he can, he reworks it. So um, I don't think it has to do with changing and blocking an image, on, you know, making it worse or anything. I mean, he's really, like you see, uh, the thing about the states that's so fascinating is you see the wheels working. <laughs> and just to add, um, Hyatt Mayer has this very famous quote that you couldn't do what Rembrandt did if you weren't as confident as an artist as he was, where you wipe out an entire part of your composition and do something different. So I think it really shows his strength. Would you then say, Ellery Kurtz asked, would you then say that early states are actually unfinished works? Anybody? Uh, in some cases, they clearly are. In some cases, they're clearly proofs and working proofs. Um, but in Rembrandt's case, some of them are definitely proofs, but others are, uh, you know, take the three crosses, which is the most famous uh, Rembrandt series of states. Uh, the first state is clearly finished, but he's still like thinking about things and changing them. And then by the fourth state, he's completely changed the image. But that's not to say that the, you know, finished, I guess the finished third state where he signed the plate is not finished. It's just a different, he makes a di whole different image out of it. Yeah, we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions, but um, I'm gonna read out two more. One from our friend, uh, Stephanie Dickey. How early did the practice begin of etching the initial design and completing the plate with engraving. Who was the first to do this? Anyone want to take that? Rada? Um, well, Nadine can speak about it, but um, Lucas van Leiden was uh, the first in the North to mix etching and engraving. And I, I'm not sure if it's about finishing or if it's about adding effect, um, but uh, it's yeah. definitely um, when you when you get to use copper as as the matrix, you can add engraving to the plate. Okay. Yeah, I mean Lucas. Uh, let me just say Lucas. What's totally fascinating about his etchings, and he only made five. He only made them in one uh, year, and uh, often people just don't pay much attention to those etchings, but. You can, if you start looking very carefully what's etched, what's engraved, you can see that in each one, he's trying to figure out like what is the right um, uh, grouping, you know, what is the right pairing of etching and engraving uh, that works best. And each one is a slightly different combination. Do you, do, uh, do you engrave the dark, dark shadows and etch everything else? Do you only etch the face and then engrave every, or uh, engrave the face, etch everything else? And every single one is a slightly different combination. So you, it, here's another case where you can really sort of see the wheels grinding in his brain and trying to figure out what is it that etching can do for him. And in the end, he says, you know, I can do this better with engraving <laughs> on my own without the etching business. So he moves on, but uh, I think they're absolutely fascinating. But last I think what Stephanie's thinking of is probably more 18th century prints. Uh, I mean, last, last question, sorry, uh, Catherine, we're, we're, go ahead and add what you were going to, please. I just quickly to say that in, in Italy, it was very different because really etching, the beginnings of etching was the domain of the painter etcher. So of, uh, uh, the, the, the printmakers were not trained to engrave. So the, what they added to their plates, so once they, they, um, the initial etching was, came off the press, is they used dry point to then uh, add def definition and subtlety. And that happened, most, most of the early etchers did that, but they, they, they seldom used engraving, apart from Battista Franco a bit later. Right. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to uh, my friend, old friend Amy Worthen's question, but we can leave it for you to uh, think about. 
Uh, Nadine, have you had new insights or discoveries once the works were together in the exhibition? We kind of covered that, uh, but thoughts that are not in the catalog. Maybe you could answer uh, Amy offline. Um, yeah. And we will get to the <laughs> questions and we will try to answer those as well, either by email or offline uh, because our time is up. And so I want to thank um, all of you, our all-star panelists, uh, Nadine, Freda, and Catherine. I'm sure that I speak for everyone here in expressing our gratitude to you for the exhibition, the book, and today's uh, wonderful panel. Uh, we all have come away with a new understanding of the origins and early development of etching. And thank all of you out there for attending next week, uh, same time, same place. Please come back to hear about the women of Atelier 17 with the author, Christina Weil, and the moderator, Jennifer, Jennifer Farrell, and other of the stellar curators from the Mets Department of Drawings and Prints. This is the first time, I'd like to mention this, this is the first time our IFPDA Book Award is being shared by by two winners, uh, by the Renaissance of Etching and by the women of Atelier 17. Uh, meanwhile, there is an interesting event virtually every day this month. Go to the IFPDA website to see what they are and to register. Uh, in closing, just a personal note, uh, please allow me as one who has uh, survived the coronavirus uh, when it wasn't looking so good, uh, allow me to ask you to wear masks. Um, and vote. <laughs> terrible at, a, at a certain level and a second ask if you're here in america get out there and vote goodbye everyone <laughs> signing off thank bye. you so much david bye-bye thank you bye, bye.